stand all of the together to worship, to lift our song to our God together. Would you stand with us? And let's do that now. God, we want to worship you today and lift our voice to praise your name. Let's sing this.
Oh God, we want to know you more. Lord, help us to, with faith, come to you and call to you as the one who truly is above over all things. Lord, would you lift our perspective? Would you lift our worship to you today? Let's give God our song. Let's trust him as we sing this. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every Thank you. 
pray with me. So Lord, we wanna meet with you today. We thank you, Lord, that you are our God and we are your people. We thank you that in your word, you say that my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. No one can snatch them out of my hand. So Lord, we're here to say we're yours. We wanna meet with you. We thank you that you adopt us as your own sons and daughters. And though you are so much higher than we could ever imagine or know even, Lord, you reach out to us through Jesus that we can know you and have a relationship with you. And so Lord, would you stir in us the desire and the ability to worship you with our life? We ask in your name, amen. Gables Church. We are so glad you're here this morning. My name is Than Baylor. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. In just a moment, we are going to have the opportunity to pay attention to a really important video, but it's a video with some sensitive material in it. It happens to be on the subject of human trafficking. And so if you're here today with your littles and you're thinking, man, that might not be for them, we highly invite you, encourage you to step out in the hallways there and there. Um, when that video comes up, it'll be in just a little bit after I get through the announcements today. You'll notice there is a QR code behind me on the screen and in the seat backs in front of you. If you would be so kind as to pull out that mobile device that you have, click on it, and you're going to be prompted to register. If you're at home, all you need to do is click on this register button in the upper right, and you can register for us. It lets us know that you're here, but it also lets us pray for you. Any number of you have things going on in your world. Many of them we won't know about unless you tell us, and we would like to join you in prayer. We get those prayer requests as a staff, and we truly do spend time before our Lord and Savior bringing your requests to him. In addition to, when you click on that lovely little link that pops up, you're going to notice another thing, and it's the weekly update. The weekly update is sort of like an electronic bulletin. It lets you know what's going on around here at the church, and one of the things I'd like to point your attention to is we're about six months into our budget year, and at this point in time, God in his graciousness, you in your graciousness, uh, have helped us. We are currently... Uh, uh, $82,000 above our spending, which is great. It's a huge thing. God has continued to meet the needs of this body and meet the needs of this church. And we just wanted to share that good news with you. It's an exciting thing that we get to uh, know about and we wanted to share it with you. Another thing that you can find on the weekly update is that next week we will be opening our classes for nursery and early childhood. That's birth through four years of age right down that hallway. And in the weekly update, you can find how to pre-register it helps us know who's coming so we can be prepared and can be ready to hang out with those littles. And that will start next week. Last, yeah, you could clap for that too. I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, in addition to this church is about loving God, loving others, making disciples. We get to do that through joining in corporate worship, through the interaction that you have with other people, through the programs, some of what I just mentioned, through your giving. We also get to do that through approaching difficult but important subjects. And Dr. Larry Donathorn is going to come up and share with us about the video I mentioned a moment ago and about international justice mission. Would you welcome him? Thank you, Than. By way of further introduction, I'm a member of this church and a volunteer for IJM. Of all the crimes against humanity, surely one of the most heinous is when one human being enslaves another out of lust and greed. It must surely break the heart of God that, according to Global Slavery Index, 40 million, more than 40 million people are enslaved right now. 
fighting against this, there are organizations in both the public and private sectors. The largest private sector organization is a Christian ministry known as International Justice Mission. In the video that we're about to play, you will see uh, actual victims of slavery who have been rescued by IJM and returned to normal life. And you will see perpetrators of the crimes against them being arrested and tried and put out of business by the law enforcement partners of IJM. Please watch now. We have operations all over the world, rescuing people from slavery, because today there are criminals who abuse children, sell girls. How old is she? 12. 12? How much? 30? Yeah, yeah, I'm at me. And force families into slavery. Criminals prey on the easiest target, the world's poor, because they expect no one to defend them. Pareho po tayo mga tao, hindi po tayo ibagay or hayo na pwedeng gamitin lang sa pansarili. But today, there are thousands of people gathering to seek justice for those in slavery. We are a group of lawyers, counselors, activists, and supporters. We are called International Justice Mission. And together, we form the largest international anti-slavery organization in the world. But slavery won't come to an end until criminals know they can't get away with it. So we partner with local police to arrest and prosecute criminals. This sends a message to slave owners. We will not go away. We stay with the survivors until they are healed, until they are free. Natulungan po ako ng IJM sa pamamigitan po na sa case ko, sa pagtulong po nila na ma-overcome ko po yung, yung fear. Each year, we rescue thousands of slaves and protect millions around the world. We are transforming how justice systems protect their citizens. To those who are still enslaved, we promise to find you. We will get you home to your families so you can have the freedom you deserve. that there will be no one there to protect them. It's up to us in the wealthy nations of the world to be there to protect those who are being exploited in the poorer countries. There is something that you and I can do 
to get justice for those who are right now being abused by sexual exploitation and um, forced labor. The bulk of the work of IJM is funded by small donations. Donations from people like you and me, members of our church who volunteer their time and money to support this cause. We can help right now, and I hope that you will join us. I will be out in the uh, Welcome Center uh, with some fact sheets and other material if you would like to talk with me further after the service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Donna Thorne, for sharing with us and uh, bringing this issue before us, something that is so big on the heart of God and so near and dear to the heart of God. And maybe God is moving on some of your hearts right now, uh, calling you to learn a little bit more and ask the question, Lord, how can I be involved? I hope you'll go talk uh, with Dr. Donna Thorne after service. Let's pray together. Please join me. Heavenly Father, how we praise you and thank you today for the gift of Jesus Christ and the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit that belongs to your children. Because of these great and merciful gifts, we can genuinely know you and live for you forever. And Father, thank you for the Bible, your holy word. Lord, it's the most valuable thing in this world, for in it we have your words, the very words of God. So would you, by the Holy Spirit, open our hearts wide to this magnificent reality this morning. And by your word, would you give us the encouragement, guidance, correction, and refreshment that we need today? Lord, please use your word to change us into the likeness of your Son, so that we might serve you without fear in holiness and righteousness forever and with great joy. And Lord, on Sanctity of Life Sunday, we pray for a change of perspective and values for our nation that can only come about as an act of God. We pray for the Holy Spirit to soften hearts with a greater love and protection for those who are in the womb. Lord, this is the type of world that we want to live in, one where all of life that you have created in your image from the womb to the tomb is valued and dignified, Lord, because we are your image bearers. Thank you, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It is so good to see you. Get your Bible out and turn to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. Uh, our point of departure this morning is verse 21 as we press deeper into this series called Luke, Good News for Everyone. There is good news for all of us uh, in the Gospel of Luke. You know, there are certain passages of Scripture that are hard. Uh, they're hard. They're just challenging passages of Scripture. And they can be hard for a variety of reasons. Uh, sometimes they're hard because they're hard to understand. I think we all have read something, and we read it, and then we say to ourselves, huh, what, what does that mean? What did I just read? Okay, even the Apostle Paul's writings were difficult for the Apostle Peter to understand. He says, some of the things Paul writes are hard to understand. That gives me great hope that an inspired apostle says of another inspired apostle that his writings are difficult to understand. Uh, sometimes the Bible is hard to understand because of what it teaches. A couple of years ago, I had someone come to me with a big issue they were wrestling with, and their question was, uh, Jeff, do these passages of Scripture really mean 
what it looks like they mean. And I said, yes, and they said, yeah, that's what I was afraid of, right? It can, it can be difficult because it teaches difficult things, and sometimes passages of Scripture are hard because, I'll say it, they're boring to our modern sensibilities. The Word of God is not a boring book, but there are sections of the Bible, especially where we have long lists of records and genealogies that can be a little monotonous. Uh, recently, in my Read Through the Bible in a Year program, I went through Ezra, and I just finished Nehemiah the other day, and there are large sections of Ezra and Nehemiah that are concerned with record-keeping. Okay, a few chapters of this type of thing, and it can quickly send you into the third stages of anesthesia. Okay, I can kind of, you're like, what? What did I just read? I know I was there. It was like highway hypnosis a little bit. So today, as we come to Luke chapter 3, uh, verses 21 through 38, we come face to face, get this, with two of these difficult issues in a single passage. We have the baptism of Jesus, and then we have the genealogy of Jesus. Let's look at these one at a time because when we understand what Luke is saying with what he's doing in both of these passages, I assure you it's absolutely rich. Okay, it's like climbing a 14er. It's going to take a little bit of work to get to the top, but once you get to the top, you forget about the hard work and your heart soars and a beautiful panoramic vision opens up in front of you. So let's look at the baptism of Jesus first. In verse 21 and 22, I'm gonna ask you if you're able to please stand with me as we read God's word today. Luke tells us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. You can be seated. Okay, after reading that, maybe you're saying to yourself, you know, Jeff, what's the problem with that passage? That isn't a, a hard passage. It's pretty obvious. Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit descended upon him and the voice of the Father came from heaven. You know, don't overthink it. Well, if you take a look at the history of interpreting this particular passage, you will see that some Christians throughout the history of the church have found this passage to be a bit of an embarrassment. Okay, an embarrassment. Why? Well, uh, because if Jesus was the sinless son of God, and that's what we believe, that's what orthodox theology teaches, why did he submit himself to a baptism that was a baptism for the repentance of the forgiveness of sins? Uh, why? Well, because if Jesus was the sinless son of God, we believe that. If he had no sin, people are saying, why does he need to repent? They say, maybe Jesus wasn't sinless after all. So some people have said that this passage is a confusing embarrassment. But Luke shows no such embarrassment. Okay, the Gospel of Matthew provides us with a little additional information. When Jesus came to be baptized by John the Baptist, John the Baptist said to him in Matthew's account, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now there's absolutely nothing to be embarrassed about in this passage. Jesus was completely righteous. Paul called Jesus our righteousness. Jesus was completely righteous from his youth. He was morally righteous. He was legally righteous. He was spiritually righteous. Okay, he was absolutely sinless. He had no need whatsoever to be forgiven of sins. But he underwent the baptism 
of John. Uh, why? Because like he said in Matthew's account, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was baptized into a baptism for the repentance and forgiveness of sins because in so doing, he identifies with his people. Jesus was not baptized to repent of his own sins, of which he had none, but to make himself one with those who did submit to this right in order to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. It was an act of solidarity with John's religious revival. And so from the crowd's perspective, Jesus' baptism was a routine baptism. But that was not the view from heaven looking down. This is a key moment in the unfolding plan and purpose of God. Jesus comes out of the water and the three persons of the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, celebrate together. And significantly, this happens when? Look at the text carefully. When Jesus is praying, do you see that? And when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, so with John looking on, Jesus comes up out of the water in an attitude of worship and submission and dependence upon the Father, Jesus begins to pray. As Pastor Kent Hughes says, three decades of incarnation, 30 winters of perfection had seasoned his human soul and being fervent in prayer, he was now ready to go public as the only begotten son of God. So the Redeemer, the Redeemer promised in the very early pages of Scripture is here. Okay, there's no more waiting. The time has come. Uh, many years ago when I graduated from seminary, uh, the church where the commencement was held had, get this, 66 panels of stained glass, one for each book of the Bible, and each of them were placed in this dome around the top of the church in Texas. In Texas, they know how to build churches. They know how to build buildings. And each of these panels had, yes, a different book of the Bible, but it was depicting key moments of salvation history. One panel depicted creation, and another depicted the exodus, and then another panel had the giving of the law. And finally, a little more than halfway through this, we came to Jesus. And right there in the middle of the story is a beautiful panel depicting the baptism of Jesus. This is another moment of glory. Just like the glory of the Lord shone around the announcement of Jesus' birth, so too does the glory of God appear to celebrate the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. This is a moment of great joy and great glory for the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As Jesus was praying, look at it. It says, the heavens were opened. The heavens were opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form, like a dove and a voice. Been thinking about that phrase all week. Beautiful phrase, a voice. A voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. The sky above the Jordan were supernaturally torn apart so that a supernatural revelation can come to the people. And with all eyes focused upward on the torn sky, multitudes watched as God the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. Now, have you ever thought about this question? Why a dove? Why a dove? Well, a dove is the most meek and innocent of all birds. Okay, a dove has no talons. Uh, it has no fierceness. Uh, nothing but love for its mate. And this is indicating to us that Jesus' ministry will be a gentle ministry. He says, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart. He says, blessed are the gentle. 
the meek, the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. And the character that Jesus produces in his people is what? Gentleness. The fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. I mean, how beautiful, how comforting, how reassuring that the Spirit did not fall on Jesus in the form of a vicious bird of war. You know, these razor-sharp talons ready to tear our flesh. Jesus is gentle, and he works gently in our lives. And this is a word of encouragement to those of us struggling with a terrible sin we don't know how to eradicate from our lives. Okay, sometimes we're reluctant to bring it to Jesus, fearing that he's going to take us through a terrible ordeal, that all of the worst things that can possibly happen are going to happen. And so we hesitate because we're afraid that we're going to get, you know, like surgery with a, a rusty knife instead of the scalpel, that the, that the cure is going to be worse than the disease. Now, Jesus is a warrior for sure, but all who come to him, they find that his ministry is characteristically gentle, that he will deal with us, he will deal with his people gently. Now, in my life, and it's probably the same for you, I have had times where I've wanted to turn from a sin But I was afraid of the shame. I was afraid of the consequences. I was afraid of dealing with it, of coming clean. I thought Jesus would deal with me like a bird of war rather than a dove of peace. So that fear of the consequences kept me trapped. But when I decided to trust in the mercy of Jesus, I was relieved at how skillfully and how gently he dealt with me and restored me. Whatever you're going through today... No matter how sordid, shameful, or consequential it may be, you can trust Jesus. Okay, he's not going to rough you up. Okay, he's not going to tear you apart. He will deal with you gently. He'll deal with you skillfully. With the skill of a great physician, he will gently remove that sin that is choking out the abundant life. Now, it may not be easy, it probably won't be easy, but his mercy will surround you and eventually he will bring you to a much better place of abundant life. Now, the first two manifestations at Jesus' baptism were visual. Okay, we had the heavens being torn apart and we had the spirit descending like a dove. The next is verbal and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Now here, the voice of the Father weaves together three Old Testament scriptures that point to the work of Messiah. After waiting for centuries on this day, these promises are being fulfilled. The first is, you are my beloved son. That comes from Psalm 2-7. From Psalm 2-7, where God says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. The emphasis here in Psalm 2 is on this unique relationship between the father and the son and the kingly reign of Messiah. Listen to Psalm 2-7. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them. Who's them? It's the nations. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Jesus' ministry was a gentle ministry as the eternal son of God. Jesus is uniquely related to the father, but because Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords, his iron scepter will crush the raging nations. 
Those who are wise will bow down and kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Friends, there are only two paths set before us in life. It's either kiss the son or be crushed. Okay, no third option. Yes, we live in an age of grace and we live in an age of mercy where God is making his proposal to the people of the world, come to Jesus, pay homage to Jesus, worship Jesus, take Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But a day is coming when God says enough and Jesus will rise up off his throne and we will get the Jesus that we see in Psalm 2, verse 7 and following. For those who refuse to pledge their allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ, God's crown king, they will be eternally crushed. But for those who pledge their allegiance to Jesus, to those who kiss the Son, they will be eternally saved and they will experience his gentle rule and reign in their lives for all eternity. And when the Father says, with you I am pleased, he weaves together two scriptures out of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 42.1 and Isaiah 53.10. Both of these passages are talking about the suffering of the Messiah. Isaiah 42.1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. And Isaiah 53.10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. So what exactly is the father pleased with? The father is pleased with the son's humble incarnation in his years of earthly conduct. For 30 years, Jesus has lived in humble circumstances in seclusion in Nazareth. He had likely served as head of household after Joseph most likely died at some point where everything Jesus earned was needed at home. He worked an honest job as a carpenter. With this, the father was well pleased. The father is pleased with Jesus interior life as well. Okay, three decades of unparalleled devotion and meditation and communion with his Father and the Holy Spirit as he grows in comprehension of who he is and the mission that God has called him to. This pleased the Father. The Father is pleased with Jesus' silent years. Okay, from infancy to childhood to manhood, Jesus grew from grace to grace, holiness to holiness, submission to submission without a single stain of sin. Jesus had navigated all of the trials of life that we face, yet he was without sin. Jesus took his perfect righteousness to the cross for you and for me. After 30 perfect years, the father was well pleased. And the father was pleased with the sufferings of his son as Messiah. Because of his suffering, an atonement for sin would be made and accomplished on the cross. And that pleased the father. This is the picture here that the entire Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are well pleased. Okay, they are well pleased with this plan of salvation now inaugurated with Jesus and to be completed in the next three years. On this special day, God is overflowing with pleasure and with joy. And Jesus is pleased to submit to the plan of God. The Spirit is pleased as he descends upon the Son of God. The Father is pleased as he declares, you are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Now that is amazing to me that the Holy Trinity rejoiced at the Jordan River as they commemorated and celebrated the official beginning of the ministry of God the Son. Now, loved ones, there is something deeply comforting in all of this because it demonstrates to us just how powerfully the whole triune God works to secure our salvation. All of God is concerned with the deliverance of souls. 
It helps us to see how Paul could so confidently say, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Now listen, no person is so messed up that they cannot be delivered by God. Maybe you feel that you've done something that God will not forgive you for. Okay, maybe it's your selfishness, maybe it's your immorality, the wasting of your life or years of your life that you've wasted. Maybe you feel like you're beyond God's grace. You may feel that way, but the Holy Trinity disagrees. Okay, the gospel that Jesus died for our sins and rose again on the third day is the good news of a divinely wrought righteousness that is made available to all who will come to him by grace through faith. The Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit delights, delights to save the unsavable. I think of the parable of the prodigal son where Jesus says when one sinner repents that all of heaven rejoices, that heaven throws a party, that all of heaven is poised to forgive. No matter how bad you are, no matter how messed up your life may be, there is a place for you in the family of God if you will repent of your sins and believe the gospel. What a hope we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the question is a very simple question this morning. Have you repented of your sins and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died for you, the one who rose again? Now, what happens oftentimes in the church is we set out these different hoops. We have a process Okay, we set out these different colored hoops and we get people to jump through the hoops and do all of the things that good Christians do. Okay, come to church and uh, read your Bible and be baptized and become a member of the church and those are all wonderful things. They're things that we should do. But it's possible to process people through this horizontal experience whereby they jump through all of the hoops yet there has been no divine transaction between heaven and earth whereby a person's sins have been forgiven because they've jumped through all of these hoops yet there never has been a moment of repenting of sins and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ so I ask you have you been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit where the old is gone and the new has come now we come to the second reason why this text is a difficult text we come to the genealogy of Jesus now let me ask you, how many of you, back in the old days, I don't even know if they make them anymore, remember those things called phone books? Uh, how many of you have ever thought to yourself, you know, I have a little insomnia tonight, so I think I'm gonna open up the phone book and I'm just gonna like read the first three pages. No, nobody reads through a phone book, right? In our Western culture, we have a tendency to see genealogies as being boring, but not so in other cultures, because in other cultures, they give a sense of identity and a purpose. Yet in our culture, we check out quickly. How many of us have done one of those read through the Bible in a year programs, and we get somewhere in the middle of the book of Numbers? And then, once again, we abandon our effort or how many of us have read through a genealogy and we get two or three verses into all the begats? Uh, so-and-so begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, who begat so-and-so, and it goes on for like a page and a half and we just check out. There are a couple of things that we can learn from genealogies. First of all, we learn that God is faithful to work generationally. That God is faithful to work generationally. He is. He works faithfully from one generation to the next. That's what we see in the genealogy of Jesus. That God is faithful to the generations. That he is faithful to fulfill all of his promises. And as a father, this is greatly encouraging to me that the same God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has been faithful to our grandparents and to our parents will be faithful to us and to our children and to our children's children 
by the mercy and the grace of God. Okay, God is a multi-generational God. Secondly, we learn that sometimes the biggest contribution that you make is not your contribution at all, but it's the contribution that comes through your legacy and through your lineage of faith that comes through your family line. Now, in Jesus' genealogy here, if I did my counting right, there are 76 names. If somebody wants to count through there, maybe you'll find an extra. If you find another one, there's really 77, just go ahead and raise your hand, and we'll ask what it is. But I see 76 names there, and get this, more than half of them we know nothing about. We have no idea who these people are. They're like you and they're like me. Okay, some of them are famous, but most of them are not. And the point to be made is this. God uses ordinary people to carry his extraordinary plans forward. It's the lesser known people who actually raise up the better known people. Now, a couple of things I want you to see in this genealogy. Take a look with me at verse 23. Jesus' ministry began when he was about 30 years of age. You see that in verse 23. Interestingly, this is the exact age when King David began his ministry as king. Then second, look at verse 31. Uh, Here David is mentioned in verse 31. Jesus is the promised son of David who is to rule and reign over the kingdom of God forever. Now third, look at where the genealogy ends. Look at verse 38. Okay, verse 38, Jesus is who? He's the son of Adam, the son of God. Now pulling these two sections together, the baptism of Jesus... With the genealogy of Jesus, it shows us that his kingship is one that Jesus shares, get this, with all of created humanity. He is God the Son, but in his humanity, he's traced all the way back to Adam. By tracing Jesus' ancestry in his humanity back to Adam, Luke is alluding to the fact that Jesus is, get this, the second Adam that he's the representative man by whose obedience humanity is rescued from the consequences of the sin of the first Adam. Okay, when the first Adam blew it, the second Adam, Jesus, was faithful. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5.22, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being, and the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Or Romans 5.17. For if, by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. The words of the Father, the pleasure of the Father resounds in these words, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. He was pleased with Jesus' 30 years of sinless life as the righteousness of God. He was pleased with the prospect of the atoning death of Jesus. And get this, he was pleased that the failed, flawed children of the first Adam, you and me, would be redeemed by the flawless, triumphant second Adam. Christ, the Son of God, became a son of Adam that we sons of Adam might become sons of God. And get this, Apart from the son's work at Calvary, none of us, none of us will ever hear these words from God the Father. You are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter with whom I am well pleased. God cannot say that to flawed humanity. 
But if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Okay, upon these new creations, he has made by grace through faith in Christ alone, his pleasure abides. To these, God says now and forever, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter. And with you, I am well pleased. I mean, just, just say it with me. Yea, God. Yea, God. I want to encourage you, if you've never repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus Christ to save you by grace, through faith, grace means it's a free gift. You can't earn your salvation. You can't work for it. But if you will come to him and say, Lord, I don't deserve it, but I'm trusting in Jesus, would you give me the gift of salvation? He will do that. And I'd encourage you to do that today. And then you can hear the voice of the Father rejoicing over you as well. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this tremendous passage, the baptism of Jesus and the genealogy of Jesus that shows us that, yes, Jesus is the Son of God, fully God, but he is also fully man. And because of that, Jesus, you are well acquainted with all of our trials and all of our temptations. You are able to sympathize with us and understand what we're going through, yet you are perfect. You are perfect. And you made a complete atonement for all of our sins. And every single person in this room can be forgiven by grace through faith in Jesus as the gift of God because of all that you have done. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And Lord, for those of us who are struggling with some uh, really difficult sin in our lives, Lord, Would you give us the power by the Holy Spirit to come to you and to trust you that you will deal with us gently and help us to become more like yourself? Lord, we love you and we thank you for this good news for everyone. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, would you stand? Let's close with our worship. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt praise the father praise the son praise the Yeah.
and held its breath Till that stone was moved for good For the Lamb that conquered death And the dead rose from their tombs And the angels stood in awe For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth God, what outrageously outrageous good news we have in Jesus. Yeah, let's give the Lord a hand and say, thank you, Lord. Hey, I want to encourage you to uh, head out to the Welcome Center and go talk with Dr. Larry Donathorne a little bit about the trafficking ministry, how you might get involved, how you might support that. And if you have a prayer need, I'm going to be right up front here in just a moment. I would be happy to pray with you. Now receive these words of blessing as you go from this place. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. God bless you. Have a great week.